The Allen Lund Company appreciates all of the dedicated carriers it takes to move loads across the U.S. Stay safe. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Scott Thompson. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. I'll be your host for today while Mark is away. We will hear from Mark, though. He sat down and spoke with the CEO and founder of a company called Revoy that's investing heavily in hybrid technology. It's amid this massive push to make electric trucks a thing, but Revoy is taking a different tact here. Ian Rust will tell us how the technology works and maybe more importantly, how they're working through some of the challenges that a hybrid semi creates. We'll answer all your questions on that and then some in that conversation. And after that, we'll check in with our state legislative expert, Keith Goble of Landline Magazine, who's got updates on a few states that are moving to address the truck parking problem there and a few others that are looking at changes to their move over laws. So we've got a good one for you today. But first, the news with Ryan Witkowski. Thanks, Scott. Two trucking groups have taken California's Assembly Bill 5 to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. The California Trucking Association and the owner-operator Independent Drivers Association say that AB5 violates the U.S. Constitution. The two trucking groups filed a notice of appeal on Friday, April 12th. The case surrounds California's controversial worker classification law that was signed into law in 2019. The law is based on the ABC test, which requires a business to demonstrate three factors are established before a worker can be deemed an independent contractor. The B prong of the ABC test appears to prevent a trucking company from classifying a truck driver as an independent contractor, regardless of the level of control or any other factors. The California Trucking Association and OOIDA contend that AB5 imposes undue burdens on interstate commerce in violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. In addition, OOIDA and the state trucking group have said that the law's decisions on who it exempts violate the U.S. and California Constitution's equal protection clauses. Now that this notice of appeal has been filed by the state's trucking association and OOIDA, deadlines for forthcoming motions and arguments should be released soon. In a statement from OOIDA, the association says it, quote, respectfully disagrees with the legal basis for the decision issued by the district court. The body of one of the missing construction workers has been found at the site of the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. According to media reports, salvage teams on Sunday located what they believed to be one of the missing construction vehicles. A body was discovered inside the car. The victim's name has not been released. There were eight construction workers on the bridge at the time that the cargo ship crashed into the bridge, causing its collapse. Two workers were rescued. Four have now been recovered. The two remaining workers are still missing and are presumed dead. A 78-year-old man was the victim who died from his injuries after Clintard Parker drove a stolen tractor-trailer into the Texas Department of Public Safety building in Brenham last week. The victim is identified as Bobby Huff. Huff was transported to a hospital by a medical helicopter after the incident, but he later succumbed to his injuries. Parker remains in the Washington County Jail. He has been charged with three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, causing serious bodily injury, one count of evading arrest or detention causing serious bodily injury, and one count of unauthorized use of a vehicle. A post by the Texas Department of Public Safety said six people were injured and required transportation to area hospitals. Two victims remain in critical but stable condition. The investigation into this incident is ongoing and is being performed by the Texas Rangers. Diesel prices are down four cents a gallon, bringing the total to four dollars and one cent. That, according to the latest report from the Energy Information Administration, prices were down in nine of the ten regions' EIA tracks. The Lower Atlantic saw the biggest drop of six cents a gallon, bringing the total to three dollars and ninety-seven cents. New England went up slightly, just by a penny, to four dollars and thirty-one cents a gallon. This week, ProMiles report had diesel at $4.01 a gallon, an increase of $0.02 cents at the pumps compared to last week. Prices went up in eight of the ten regions ProMiles tracks. The West Coast saw the biggest jump of $0.05 cents a gallon, bringing that total to $4.79. The Rocky Mountain region had only a slight decrease of a penny per gallon, bringing the total there to $3.85. A second lawsuit has been filed in a deadly crash involving a concrete truck and a school bus. On March 22nd, the truck veered into oncoming traffic, striking the bus and causing it to roll. The incident happened on a rural highway outside of Austin, Texas. 
A five-year-old on the bus and a 33-year-old man who was driving behind the bus were both killed. A mother and her child who were injured in the crash filed the second lawsuit against the truck driver and his company. Jerry Hernandez, he was charged with negligent homicide in the crash. According to a police report, Hernandez admitted to using marijuana the night before and cocaine the morning of the crash. He'd also reportedly been operating on very little sleep. According to reports, Hernandez had a criminal record dating back nearly two decades. His record included previous charges of driving with a suspended license and just last year, charges of abuse. The first lawsuit in this incident was filed by a teacher that was on the bus. Both lawsuits seek more than a million dollars in damages. A former owner of a CDL school in Philadelphia was sentenced to almost five years in prison for bribing a CDL examiner and witness tampering. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, 53-year-old Vladimir Simbalenko was sentenced to 57 months in prison, three years of supervised release, and a $5,000 fine. The former owner of Vlad's CDL school in Philadelphia was found guilty of bribing a CDL examiner to pass some of his students who did not actually pass their CDL tests, some who never even took the test, and of asking a witness to lie. In October of last year, he pled guilty to one count of bribery concerning programs receiving federal funds and one count of witness tampering. The original indictment against Simbalenko alleged that he paid cash bribes totaling more than $10,000 to a former third-party CDL examiner between 2015 and 2018. 28,000 packs of illegal cigarettes were found in a tractor trailer during a stop last week in Arkansas. KAIT reports that a truck was stopped on Interstate 40. A search of the vehicle led law enforcement officials to 27,940 packs of untaxed contraband cigarettes, valued at more than $243,000, along with $4,142 in cash. 35-year-old Emil Bongora of Atlanta, Georgia, was arrested on suspicion of possession of untaxed tobacco. According to the Department of Finance and Administration, it was the second largest seizure in tobacco control's history in Arkansas. The largest took place in October of last year near Carlisle when agents seized 32,671 packs. New tools will be available to assist employers with training truck drivers in Canada. Trucking HR Canada recently announcing it'll be launching a brand new suite of industry resources aimed to help organizations of all sizes train and assess drivers and instructors throughout their careers. The national nonprofit says the new resources will help fleets, operators, and trainers. The 16-piece suite will be available for download from truckinghr.com starting Thursday, April 18th. This is the same day as the kickoff of Truck World, a trucking trade show that will go on until Saturday, April 20th in Mississauga, Ontario. And finally, a surprising discovery that dates back more than a century was found in a home in Michigan recently. UPI reports that a homeowner hired a crew to do repair work in his home. Part of the job included cutting through the bathroom ceiling. That's where the workers found a stash of items. Among the 12 items found was a handwritten note with a drawing, a tiny cast iron pan, a small percussion instrument, a marble, a couple of dominoes, a picture of Jesus, and newspaper clippings from 1915. The homeowner said the place was built in 1910 and he thinks some kid living there thought his stuff was important enough to leave for someone in the future. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Ryan Witkowski. Thanks, Ryan. For updates on these stories and more from the trucking industry, check out our website, landline.media. From reporting and opinion pieces to pretty much anything in between, check it all out at landline.media. Coming up next, we'll have that conversation with Ian Rust of Revoy, the company that's devoted itself to developing and producing hybrid semis. Ian will tell us what's behind the technology and how it works, and also how they're getting around some obvious challenges, including increased weights and the power grid, and a few other things as well. That's up next, a great conversation there, but first, a quick break. So stick around. Landline Now continues in just a moment. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Penske owns and operates some of the best maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. 
Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2024 when you purchase Loadboard Pro. Landline Now, welcome back. The push for electric trucks by California and the federal government has a lot of people talking in trucking, and many are concerned over issues like cost, charging infrastructure, reliability, and range. But another technology related to electric may have some answers. The idea of hybrid vehicles and trucking has been tossed about, but doesn't seem to get a lot of traction in some circles, despite having great success in the car market. However, a company based out of California is investing in hybrid technology in trucks, and they think their solution could be the answer for truckers looking toward future tech. The company is called Revoy, and I spoke recently with the firm's CEO and founder, Ian Rust. Well, first, I'm wondering if you can just kind of explain broadly this technology your company's working on. Um, it's it, it's pretty interesting, and of course, right now, a very hot topic. Again, broadly speaking, what is this technology? How does it work? Yeah, totally. Um, so what, what Revo d- does is we make an uh, electric vehicle, and what it does is it instantly integrates with any semi truck on the road today, regardless of age, anything, and it brings in zero emissions power uh, to the vehicle, which reduces the load on the diesel engine um, and increases fuel efficiency by as high as 70 to 80%. Uh, and in fact, we hit a uh, new record uh, of 120 MPG several weeks ago, which is just a, a huge step up in in terms of the the um, uh, fuel efficiency of these of these trucks. And the the really two important things that we can do um, is we can do this at cost parity or below with diesel, and we can do it without any payload impact. Um, so we never displace any payload, um, which is a pretty unique trait of any electric vehicle technology in the industry. I'm wondering if you can describe for folks who can't see this, of course, because this is, you know, we don't have one of them right here, but describe what this looks like, because it it kind of looks to me like a little trailer between the cab and the semi-trailer. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a great way to to think about it. Um, uh, So, High level, um, you know, the the tractor trailer is a modular vehicle, right? There's the trailer and the tractor. And so what we're introducing is a third module. Um, What it does is it sits, and this is the vehicle, it sits in between the tractor and the trailer. It hooks up to the tractor just like a trailer um, and nothing more on top of that. So it's just the airlines, the J560, um, and obviously the upper lower fifth wheel. And then the exact same on the back end. So to the trailer, it looks like a tractor. We then have a uh, pre-charged, um, and that's what we do for our customers. We install the charging infrastructure. Um, that all basically gets wrapped up into that per mile fee that we charge um, that is at cost parity or below with diesel. And it takes that power from the battery pack, puts it out onto its axle, which reduces the load on the engine that's hauling it, right? And that's how we drive the fuel efficiency. Um, it, in terms of what it looks like, yes, it looks like sort of a, a trailer, um, but what it is actually is a dolly. Um, and um, maybe some of your your viewers have seen like uh, the, the like a Jeep. Um, it really is like a Jeep, uh, but with a battery pack on top of it. Um, but yeah, it's a dolly that basically sits in between the tractor and the trailer and turns it into a diesel electric hybrid in a matter of minutes. Um, it really is super quick. Um- A lot of folks, of course, when they talk about electrification or hybridization of trucks, they really want to build it into the vehicle. What gave you the idea of doing a separate unit between the tractor and trailer as opposed to going the other way? It comes down to a lot of things. Um, the the first one that I, I mentioned previously comes down to the the payload impact. When you ter- when you split out the electrification into a self contained. Uh, 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 rapidly applied vehicle, it means you can also take it off just as quickly. Um, So what we actually do for our customers is as the trucks enter the our yards, 
Um, we call these yards swapping stations because what they basically do is drop off a spent Revoy EV and pick up a, a pre-charged one in sort of a refueling process. Um, when they come into the yard, we actually weigh the truck. Um, and if the vehicle overall GVW uh, with our vehicle attached, our vehicle right now weighs 22,000 pounds, so it's not nothing. With If, if we can fit in that 80,000 pound weight budget, great. We hop on, we provide all these fuel savings, it's great. And if we don't fit, well, we just wave that truck on and they just go back to the what they were just before, which was a regular old diesel tractor trailer. And so in both of those situations, they're not having to think about how they load the trailer. They don't have to basically budget for, you know, a battery weight tax, as we sometimes call it. Um, they can just haul the same trailer with the same trucks and we opportunistically add electric power. And that's what you get when it's a separate vehicle. It allows you to just insert it when it makes sense and pull it off when it doesn't make sense. Um, so it's a very f flexible and, and modular approach to it. Um, so that's reason number one. Um, the other reason for this is that um, it really makes it possible for it to be at cost parity with diesel. And what that comes down to is utilization. Um, so right now, um, basically, if you're putting the batteries, for example, in the in the tractor for in the case of uh, like a battery electric semi, those batteries now are basically strongly tied to the, the driver, unless, for example, you're slip seating it, which is it's it's common, but it's not the, you know, the the primary MO for, for operation. And so uh, at the end of that driver's hours of service, you know, that asset is now idle, which is totally fine with a diesel. But when you have, you know, a three, four times more expensive of electric, you really need to get that thing on the road earning, right? Um, and so ha by having it be a separate unit, we can actually have it be shared across multiple drivers, and it can actually be either charging or discharging 24 hours a day. Um, and that makes it possible for it to be actually economical for our customers. Um, the other thing that we do, um, then this is separate from the vehicle topology, uh, is we source the electricity for our customers. So we make sure that the operational expenses, uh, that the energy costs are, aren't low enough. We also handle maintenance, so no need to like, you know, think about how to retool a maintenance fleet around a new powertrain. We take care of all of that. So yeah, but getting into the vehicle, that's why it's a separate vehicle is utilization as well as the payload impact. Um, you also get to do some really cool things. Um, it doubles as a yard tractor. So what we actually do for our customers, and this is one of the things that our customer drivers really like, other than the additional power, that's the big thing everybody likes. But the second thing everybody likes is we run um, what we call a trailer valet service. So when our customer drivers come into our yard, our vehicle actually uh, hops off the back of them all by itself. Um, right now we do that remote piloted with essentially an attendant at the swapping station. They go and they park the trailer or they go and just drop the trailer and grab a new Revo EV that's you know fully charged, hook it up and then hop onto the back of the truck and get back on the road. That process is extremely quick. It takes about four minutes, which is actually faster than filling up a tank of diesel. Um, so that's the other reason is it allows us to do this like very seamless, like they don't need to mess with the landing gear. Um, really, they just, the only reason they, they need to get out of the truck is for pre-trip inspections. Um, but other than that, they can just be taking a break. Um, so we, we can also do that. Um, I'm kind of curious here, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit, um, but um, obviously when you're dealing with two different propulsion systems, the diesel and the electric there, the driver has to have some way of signaling to that electric unit, hey, it's your time to take over here. Um, uh, I don't know if you can explain it in layman's terms, but but how does that trucker signal the unit, hey, it's your time to shine electric thing? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, this is what every driver asks first. Um, yeah, what is it like to drive? Um, so in terms of how they control the vehicle, they use the exact same things they currently use. So uh, brake pedal, gas pedal, uh, steering wheel, shifter, right? There's no additional interface. Um, the way it works basically is we have sensors in the kingpin of our vehicle um, that allow us to know what the driver is doing. Um, so when they hit that accelerator pedal, we know immediately and we just assist with uh, 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 pulling the load. Um, the way that works is essentially it's a force sensor. When you're pulling on it, you can see tension in that force sensor, and then we know what to do in that situation. Same goes for when that Jake brake gets hit, right? That actually then compresses that sensor, and we can then help with braking. We also have uh, a sensor on the uh, service brake line, 
right? So as soon as the driver hits the brakes, hits that brake pedal, we can detect it actually even before the drum brakes apply and start applying regenerative braking. Um, so that additional uh, braking, not only does that save brake pads, right? Like you're, you, you are getting assistance on braking and just inherently less of the energy is going into heat to heating up those brake pads. Um, uh, but it also allows for the uh, tractor to be more nimble. So, um, we can actually shorten the stopping distance of the tractor trailer by about 30% just by the fact that we have additional braking power in the form of regenerative braking. And then what's great about that is that energy isn't just going away, right? It's getting recharged back into the battery and then that can be used to improve range on the vehicle. Um, the other thing just on the, the, the safety side of things, you know, not only does the additional power on that axle help with braking, it, it also helps with acceleration. You know, they love the extra power um, uh, our customer drivers do. And part of why that is, is because, you know, it being not, for example, not able to match speed when merging onto a highway, that's inherently dangerous when you have different speeds of traffic trying to merge together. But if you can get a tractor trailer to accelerate up to highway speed on any on-ramp, which is largely what we can do, it just makes that process uh, simpler and safer. Same goes for passing, same goes for changing lanes. All that just becomes easier because you're just a more nimble vehicle. Um, so yeah. So um, looking at one of the big concerns truckers have had with purely electric trucks, uh, range. Yeah. how far these things can go. Because, of course, if you're dealing with diesel, you've got a 1,200 to 1,800-mile range on a fill-up. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, essentially, I guess you still have that, but how far does the electric have the capability to go on its own on a charge? Definitely. Yeah, so right now with our current battery pack, which is 525 kilowatt hours, um, it's approximately 170 miles of all-electric range. Um, one thing to note, though, is unlike a battery elect electric semi, it's not the only powertrain on board, right? You still have the diesel powertrain. And so the way we describe our, our vehicles, it's fail operational. So um, if you happen to run out of batteries um, or say there's some system fault on board, um, these types of things can happen, right? It just becomes an axle, right? And while there is the extra dead weight, it's not going to be calamitous for, say, completing the delivery, right? If you run out of battery with an electric semi, you're stuck. And now you got to get a tow. You got to send another truck out there to finish the delivery. Extremely costly. With us, yes, there is the uh, there is an MPG hit uh, from the extra weight, but it's not going to jeopardize the mission. Um, so that's one big difference. Um, the other thing around range, too, um, just to note, is in, in our opinion, the, the big problem with range is actually not so much the, the range itself, but what happens at the end of that range? So one of those is, right, you potentially could get stuck. There's range anxiety there. But let's say, you know, uh, you're just operating it normally. You, you know, are at 10% battery. You go in for a charge. Well, now you got to wait potentially several hours for a charge. Um, you know, I was just actually reading a op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that followed an early adopter of an electric semi in California, and they were actually making half the deliveries they normally were, um, which would be a very big problem, right, in terms of how much money you can make. Um, and so the way we get around this problem is what we do is we run swaps, right? So instead of um, at the end of that range having to sit and wait for that charge, they just drop off the unit. It goes and charges on our time, not on their time, right? And they get a fully charged vehicle ready to go back on the road in four minutes, right? And that's actually why we focus almost exclusively on long haul. Um, we we believe that the way you do long haul with electric vehicles is not to you know wait for some magical battery technology that can pack you know maybe 500 600 miles in uh, god forbid 1200 miles like that's you know very far in the future in terms of battery uh technology um what we're doing is we're just making that stop for the for the recharge just as low impact as possible and then what we're having our our customers do is basically just stop and swap approximately every 240 miles. Um, so our next version of our vehicle is going to have a bigger battery pack and that all electric range is actually going to be 240 miles. And um, that's how actually um, our customers are going to be able to do about 95% electrification um, on real world deliveries. I've been talking with Ian Rust, CEO and founder of Revoy. We'll be back with more of that conversation in a moment. I'm Mark Reddick and this is Landline Now. Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020. 
and get your life back. Firestone tires are for more of everything. With more durability for more miles and more confidence in your fleet, Firestone's tested tires help fleets save with value where it matters most. Find your local Firestone dealer today at firestonetire.com dealer. When it's time to overhaul your truck engine, help protect it by insisting on a genuine Vibratec TVD crankshaft damper. Heavy duty, absolute premium quality, and they're made right here in the USA. Find a dealer at vibratechtvd.com. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now. Welcome back. Before the break, we were listening to a conversation I had recently with Ian Rust, the CEO and founder of a company called Revoy, which has developed a hybrid power system for large trucks. We now join that conversation in progress. I want to get to another thing that's been a concern. You addressed it a little bit earlier, but I want to get a little bit more uh, specific with it, and that's the weight consideration. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, axle weight is one thing, but you've also got that 80,000-pound total weight. And I, I've got to think these batteries weigh a lot. You mentioned earlier trying to fit it in in that budget. Have Have you taken a look at at how many loads are – bluntly light enough to go with this truck or, or how are you addressing that no that um no that is how we're doing it i mean our, our whole strategy is basically we filter the trailers right um when you look at the data from the federal highway administration what's really astounding actually is at, at the current vehicle weight um which is really it's going to end up being lighter um in the future it's very much at the beginning of its light weighting journey um it's uh it can fit on two-thirds of tractor trailers today um, and it's just that that upper one third of, you know, beverage beverage distribution, you know, these really heavy loads, you know, t- fuel tankers. That's the, those are the things that we wave on. But things like e-commerce, electronics, uh, supply chain, all of these things either tend to cube out or are honestly aren't fully loading their trailers. Um, and those are the ones that we we apply ourselves to. For, so, for example, with our current customer in uh, Arkansas, Texas, it's uh, 24 out of 26 loads we can hop onto, And then we just skip those two every day. Um, and that's, uh, that's actually how we're able to be zero payload impact too. Uh, because once again, in, in both of those scenarios, whether you're skipping it or you're squeezing yourself in, um, you're not changing how you're loading the trailer. It's the same trailer. Whereas if you have additional batteries, either in the tractor or there's also some, uh, e-trailers coming out, if it's permanently in the trailer, that's now sort of like a, an asterisk, right? On the, on the, uh, behavior and the way you can load that trailer. You now need to, you know, communicate with your shipper and literally the loading crew, you know, don't put that extra 5,000 pounds, only load it to 40,000 pounds, you know, and if there's any communication breakdown, that's now an illegal vehicle. Um, and, you know, even if you do it correctly, right, that's now payload that needs to be displaced into another truck. And so that increases the costs with going electric. Whereas with us, um, there's no displacement of load into other trucks. We just skip the ones that are too heavy. Um, and that's really, really powerful in terms of making um, electric trucking economical and really low friction, right? Um, it really is tough to, to, you know, route an electric truck so that it never encounters a too heavy trailer or now you have to interact with all your shippers. It's really like a new way of operating that, um, in, my, in my opinion, the way I describe it is it violates sort of a an implicit social contract in trucking, right? If you put 45,000 pounds in that trailer, anybody can haul it, right? And that's no longer true with electric, um, but it is true with Revoy. We, we, we restore that social contract. Okay. Um, another big concern out there is the charging infrastructure and and the power generation capability. Um, and obviously, you're looking at a significant impact on the grid uh, and uh, charging infrastructure has got to be built out. Um, so kind of looking at that, how does your company propose to deal with that challenge, especially in the long haul portion of the industry where these folks are crossing whole vast distances of the country? Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a major challenge just across the whole industry. I mean, not just trucking, passenger vehicles as well. Like that story is yet to be written. Um, and, you know, part of the problem is that there's a there's a chicken egg problem, right? Like no one wants to build charging infrastructure if there aren't 
trucks on the road to utilize it, that's a bad investment, right? Like you're just, no one's going to do that. Same goes for the trucks. You know, you're not going to buy a truck that you can't operate where you need it to, right? Um, so it, it, it's just who moves first, right? And so what we do is we we short circuit that chicken egg problem. So we deploy the charging with the vehicle. Um, and what that allows us to do is immediately have utilization on the chargers because they're with the vehicle. Um, and then one just important feature of the vehicle is um, because it is um, what, what we'll call what we'll call purely additive, meaning the truck can operate just fine without it. Right. It can just revert back to diesel. Um, we can partially electrify routes. So, for example, um, on our route in Texas and Arkansas, Arkansas, we're we're on a 900 mile long haul lane, but we're actually starting out just on a 240 mile stretch in the middle of it. So our customer comes into our area of service, we hop on, uh, they leave the area of service, we hop off. And so our vehicles are very um, tightly um, uh, limited in terms of their area of operation, which means that you don't need to build a whole charging network to support these vehicles. They immediately go to an area where they just immediately have charging availability and those chargers immediately have utilization. So that's sort of on the on the charger side of things. Now, on the electricity sourcing side of things, you know, um, you're absolutely right. You know, we're getting out into more rural communities where, you know, uh, potentially there's need for grid upgrades, although honestly, there's need for grid upgrades everywhere, coasts, big cities everywhere. Um, and so one, um, that is just something that I think it is a little bit unreasonable to ask for trucking fleets to to get into. Essentially, you're asking them to get into uh, electricity markets, um, and they never had to do that when we're talking about diesel refueling. Right. There's just fuel stops everywhere. And now it's basically like they're being asked to you know, do all of this infrastructure work, which has never been something they've been asked to do. And I don't particularly think that's like a fair thing to ask them to do. And so that's what we provide as part of our service is we source that electricity. So if it requires infrastructure upgrades, we do just that. Um, but one of the strategies we employ to really limit our need to upgrade, um, for example, substations or, uh, you know, other grid assets is we do, we do onsite uh, generation. So we're actually building a solar farm in Arkansas. Um, it's by far the cheapest way to source electricity, um, and it also sidesteps the grid constraints. Um, and so with that, plus some grid, you can charge 24 hours a day at a very low rate um, and also not have to source as much from the grid. Um, and that's one really nice thing about getting into long haul is, you know, you get out into these areas where it's not like the port of Long Beach, where there is no space to put a solar farm. You're out in, uh, you know, rural Texas, rural Arkansas, really wherever it may be. And yeah, there is land to build solar farms, to build generation, to build, say, natural gas with weight heat, waste heat reclamation. Um, a lot of options open up once you're out into long haul. Um, and that's how we tackle that. I just had one other question that that I was kind of curious about, and that is um, I've, I've been reading up on your technology, and there was some indication that these units would provide some more abilities beyond just the simple propulsion. Um, can you talk a little bit about what else these things are designed to do? Because that kind of interested me. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right now it's really a, a, a torque assist product, right? But what we want to turn it into and what we're working on right now um, in terms of advanced features uh, is turning it into more of a, a true driving assistant. Um, and so that does include the torque assist, you know, that does, that is assisting them when they press that accelerator, when they press that brake pedal. And there are, you know, safety improvements there, like we mentioned before, with merging and, and stopping distance. Um, but we want to go further. Um, and so the important feature to note on this is, is well, there's actually two features. Features. The first is that we have steering on that back axle of ours, that one axle underneath the trailer. Um, and that allows us to, uh, one, operate it as a yard tractor, um, do the hookups um, so you can just drive around, honestly, like a large RC car. Um, but then on the highway, what we can do is basically um, do situationally aware dynamic stabilization. And the, the key is situational awareness. And so we have 360 degree cameras on board um, that can identify other cars. It can identify where the road ends, where there's curbs, where there's buildings, where there's pedestrians. Right. Um, and what we're what we're working on is basically, you know, there's the classic example of going on a, uh, a tight right hand turn and potentially popping the curb. Right. Or perhaps perhaps scraping a sidewall on the curb and damaging the truck. Well, what we're going to be doing is using the steering and the cameras on board to find that curb and just pull the trailer around that corner um, and uh, making the, the, the trailer and the tractor uh, 
actively avoidant of collisions with with things in the scene. Now, if steering to avoid that curb means that, you know, there's a bit of oncoming traffic um, and you would collide with that, uh, maybe it's better to pop the curb or, you know, say it's a building, it's either a building, you know, run into the corner of a building or uh, oncoming traffic, right? In that situation, it's better to maybe put on the parking brake and say, hey, slow down, you're going to run into something, right? Um, that's one thing. Um, and then also at speed on the highway, you can do um, really cool stuff, um, literally stuff that like fighter jets do, which is dynamic active stabilization. So you get hit by a gust of wind. Um, we can go and steer and stabilize the trailer and prevent it from tipping. Or you're starting to jackknife and, you know, the front end of that trailer is starting to drift off to the side. Well, we can just pull that trailer back in line. And this can all be done with little tiny micro adjustments, um, oftentimes imperceptible to the driver. Um, and but basically make them safer. Um, you know, we we internally uh, so we do a lot of testing internally, and we have a really excellent uh, uh, test pilot. Uh, her name's Beverly. She's a 30 year industry veteran. Used to haul tanker trucks, so one of the more dangerous loads. Um, very experienced. And one of the things we definitely uh, you know know about the industry is experience in driving really matters. Like the experienced drivers, they're the safest. They, they just they know what they're doing. And we really want to uh, give a lot of those abilities to less experienced drivers, new drivers. We want to give them a lot of those skills um, that you only gain from experience. And the way we can do that is basically by putting them into the driving assistant. Um, and so just make any driver have the skills and experience of an experience of a of an experienced driver. Um, and yeah, so and it's all enabled by the steering and the uh, sensors, specifically cameras. Okay. Well, as I said, Ian, that's all I have. Is there anything else that you want to add or you think maybe I didn't ask about that I should have? Yeah, let's see. Um, I think the big thing here is um, well, that I want to, that I'd like to leave everyone with is, you know, right now, um, electrification is really messy and complicated in commercial vehicles. And what's unfortunate about that is there's definitely some really aggressive goals out there. Um, and it's it's definitely very difficult to make the economics work to comply with those goals, right? Um, and what we really want to impress on people is that it's not it's not a, a inherent feature of electric vehicles. It's just the way that the products look right now, pre revoy. Um, but if we do things a little bit differently and apply new technologies, um, rather than just doing the same thing but electric, we can actually make it not just competitive with um, diesel uh, freight, but actually a lot better, a lot safer. We can actually drive anywhere between 5 to 10% uh, fuel savings, inclusive of our fees, um, and then uh, also have a better driving experience for the driver. You know, one thing, for example, we do um, just in terms of the, the operation of the vehicle to provide some more color is it also acts as sort of like a cruise control. So what the driver does is they get up to speed on the highway and they actually don't even need to mess with their onboard cruise control. They can just take their foot off the gas and it will actually hold speed and act as the cruise control. In that situation, it's actually 100 percent electric. And uh, I you know, would love to host you uh, for, for a demo ride out in California someday. Uh, but it's really cool how quiet and how low vibration the cab gets in that situation. It's extremely relaxing. Um, and so that's just one of the things that electric can bring. Um, and if we if we, uh, you know, adopt these new technologies, we, we can get around the constraints um, that are causing the electrification uh, uh, journey for commercial vehicles to be so difficult right now. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, Ian, thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Likewise. I appreciate it as well. Great meeting you, Mark. I've been talking with Ian Rust, CEO and founder of Revoy, a company that's created a diesel-electric hybrid system for trucking. You can learn more about the company and see videos of their hybrid tech in action at their website, Revoy.com. Again, that website is Revoy.com. We'll have links to that website, along with all the other website links, email addresses, and phone numbers we mention here on the air at our website, LandlineNow.com. Just click on the photo or headline at the top of the page. Again, that's at our website, LandlineNow.com. And you can follow the latest news on emission regulations and trucking or other industry issues in the pages of Landline Magazine or through the website, Landline.media. Again, that website is Landline.media. We'll be back in just a moment with more of the program. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. 
Capital Reman, your leader in remanufactured diesel engines and components, is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Let us help you avoid costly downtime and repairs by visiting CapitalReman.com today. Use code OOIDA10 to receive your member benefits. Get the most power performance out of your rig with Howe's Diesel Defender. It provides maximum lubricity and contains specialized IDX4 detergent to clean and prevent deposits and safely removes harmful water. Visit HowesProducts.com for more information. Attention professional drivers, do you owe money to the IRS? Integrity Tax Relief Group frees drivers from IRS trouble. Call for help now, 855-976-4291. That's 855-976-4291. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. A few more states commit to addressing the truck parking problem while others eye changes to move over laws. Welcome back to Landline Now and our weekly state legislative update. Scott Thompson here, closing out the show with the help of our friend from Landline Magazine, Keith Goble. Keith, always good to see you. Scott, good to see you. Let's start in Georgia here, where there's a bill dedicated to increasing truck parking statewide. It's made it to the governor's desk. Uh, What exactly would this bill do if signed into law? Now they're looking to uh, just make things just a just a little bit better for truck drivers uh, in the state of Georgia, um, which is maybe the most simplistic way of of looking at it. Uh, you know, this goes back uh, a year ago. They had a, a group, a panel, whatever you want to call them, uh, get together and um, study how in the state they might be able to better address. Uh, truck driver needs, um, and you know, at the end of the year, and, and we 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 talked about it numerous times here over the past uh, several months. Um, whenever they wrapped up their meetings before the start of the 2024 regular session there in Georgia, uh, they came up with about a dozen recommendations for things that they could uh, pursue to again, go back to making things a little bit better for, for truck drivers there in the state. So they came up with, you know, this, this legislation, uh, it's a freight logistics uh, implementation plan, to, again, to address some needs. It's like a 20-year plan as they're, as they're targeting, um, making improvements to uh, or, or getting done critical projects. And, and within that, they would include uh, interstate widening, uh, widening of non-interstate uh, arterial roads, and then addressing uh, intermodal, uh, multimodal uh, capacity improvements, and uh, truck parking. Truck parking was its own bill, its own uh, uh, issue that they wanted to address uh, with a specific piece of legislation. Uh, and that, um, essentially a recommendation that came from this group of lawmakers meeting again uh, last year uh, is really what they've um, what they've sent to the governor and uh, wanting to obviously make more truck parking available there in the state of Georgia here over the coming years. And it's encouraging when a state, I think, tackles it like this because they didn't just say, hey, we're going to throw some money at this issue. They actually mm-hmm. studied it, as you mentioned there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you do that, I think it brings awareness to state lawmakers there in Georgia and any other state that does this because they may not understand the reality for truck drivers out there and just how difficult it is to find a safe place to park when they need to. So, um, you know, they came to this uh, conclusion here that there's just not enough truck parking, which is the conclusion in, I would guess, you know, pretty much every state that you you, you would do something like this in, and and they're going to do something about it. So it's encouraging. Yeah, and, and we've seen, uh, you know, here, and we've talked about it here in recent months. I mean, there's there, there's legislatures around the country that are starting to bring this up as a topic, uh, and definitely good to see, in this case, you know, Georgia, um, that is taking the next step. Uh, now, as... As OIDA has pointed out, obviously, for a long, long time, 
I'm being an advocate for additional truck parking. Uh, you know, Doug Morris uh, with the OIDA said, you know what? We've seen states study this thing to death. Yeah, it is time to actually get moving and make more truck parking available. Um, but but yeah, definitely Georgia headed in the right direction. Also, very important that this was an. Um, uh, the governor's uh, administration backed pursuit. So it's awaiting the governor's signature. And obviously, it's just a matter of time and they can move on to the next step. Again, this is something that they're wanting to address over the course of the next couple of decades. But recognizing that increasing truck parking availability is a significant issue there in Georgia that they need to uh, make improvements on. Absolutely. Um, New York and New Jersey also taking a look at the truck parking problem. They've got bills in those two states. Uh, you'll have to check out landline.media key story on the website there if you want more information about those two states. Uh, speaking of New Jersey, we'll continue, or I guess we will talk about New Jersey here, but in a different context. Uh, we've got several states making changes to move over rules. New Jersey is one of them. Uh, where the governor did recently sign a bill into law. Yeah, hopefully um, here within the next few years, we'll start to see a similar movement with uh, legislatures addressing truck parking needs like they have been over the past uh, couple of years, uh, expanding the application or, or their rules for moving over, or yeah. requirements to move over for – uh, every state's got move over laws uh, for years and years and years. Of course, the, the uh, um, initial intent was to protect emergency personnel. Um, over the course of the past decade, you know, you've seen some states make modifications to include uh, other types of assistance vehicles and, and the like. Um, but there really was no movement up until, you know, uh, in recent years. To include other vehicles, I mean, just uh, folks driving down the roadway. I mean, I know, like, like for trucks, that take up a good portion of the side of, of a roadway, and if mm -hmm. they're pulled off, I mean, there's a definite concern there. Uh, and then, of course, you know, for you know, if you're a motorist going down the highway uh, and you have an issue, you know, there's that there's that safety concern as well. So we, we we've seen here over the past couple of years, uh, more states take action to include all roadway users. Uh, we've got more than 20 states now that have done that, and uh, that is a trend continuing with uh, New Jersey Governor's uh, Phil Murphy signing into law uh, an expansion of their move-over protections. So it will apply to any vehicle that's along the side of the road uh, in New Jersey. Yeah, and as you mentioned there, we have seen a number of states address this issue in recent years. Um, it does seem like something that has kind of caught their attention. Um, you mentioned New Jersey. It's a law there now, Right. Uh, we've got a few more that you've actually been eyeing as well that are at least considering changes to move over laws. Mm -hmm. um, any in particular that kind of stand out to you? What uh, what states are looking at it right now? Well, you know, and I'll uh, just quickly kind of go back to New Jersey and yeah. what some of these other states have included in their legislation is uh, if you're parked along the side of the road and you you're just sitting there, maybe you're in your vehicle. Um, without any lights flashing and no, no uh, hazard indicators on, uh, the protection would not apply to those vehicles. But if you are off the side, like, like in New Jersey, it says that if you, if quote unquote, a disabled vehicle with uh, hazard indicators going, then you're required to, to move over for whatever vehicle that it is. But so, yeah, essentially, if you're just sitting there with no indicators on that sort of thing, the rule would not apply. Uh, and it's, it's kind of it's essentially the case in some other states where they've got legislation uh, on the same topic. Yeah, it, it's worth pointing out in both Kansas and Kentucky, uh, they are very close to getting very similar rules uh, enacted like New Jersey has. Um they're almost to the finish line in both cases, but what we have seen is provisions that are not relevant to move over mm -hmm. uh, requirements have been added to the bills and has slowed them down, if not stalled them. Uh, one one in, in Kansas, they're in a conference committee uh, trying to work out their differences, both the House version and then the Senate version. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen at this point. It may. Uh, Kentucky is even more dire. They're up against the end of their legislative session. And again, there have been changes made with the legislation that is not relevant, does not affect the move over provisions. But because either these 
uh, other provisions are in it, it could kill the bill. Uh, so they're just tacking on additional. Yeah, that, some other issues. Okay. I, mean, I, I mean, obviously, move over rules. Um, they're they're pretty prominent around the country. Like as we pointed out here yeah. in recent years, we've got about half the states that have made those changes. Well, so you've got some some lawmakers that are looking to add in other provisions to a a bill that has a lot of support in hopes that uh, yeah. it'll it'll slide through that way. Yeah, you hate to see that, especially when, as you mentioned, there seems to be, you know, support for things like this. But mm-hmm. when you start tacking on other things in there yeah. that have no relation, it's kind of a bummer. But uh, I guess that's politics for you, Keith. It is. There you go. Uh, we appreciate your time. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks for having me. And that's our show for today. We thank you for tuning in. We're back tomorrow with another. So until then, take care and drive safe out there. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And And together together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.